Imagine with me for a second that um, there was a young hockey player who grew up in Montreal and a die-hard Montreal Canadian fan as he's growing up, playing junior hockey right there in Quebec, and then his dream comes true, and he's drafted by the Montreal Canadiens. He starts his pro hockey career and becomes a star player. He wears that jersey proudly, the one thing he's dreamed for his whole life. And so he bleeds Montreal Canadiens. He has a big tattoo of the crest right here on his chest. In the prime of his career, he comes to the management and asks for a trade. Not just to any team, to Toronto. <laughs> Can you imagine, though? Can you imagine the, the, the process everyone would have to go through to get their heads wrapped around this? Somebody who was absolutely, completely Montreal Canadiens through and through, to be asked to be traded, but then to move and to accept and embrace the new team and a new family and a new coach and a new way and new fans and new colors to make their home in Toronto and to storm that town like a house on fire. Of course, the Toronto fans would be ecstatic because the star player has chosen to come and wants to play there. The Montreal fans would be hurt and beat up and confused. So this player then makes his debut and he's playing fantastic. And he loves Toronto. But what if, what if at night he goes home and sits on his couch and slips the old Montreal jersey back on? Just because it's comfy. What if then he starts going out on public appearances in Toronto wearing the red? Would that not confuse everyone? What's going on inside of him? How long does that kind of behavior last? And before, before uh, it's all over. But he asked for the trade. That's what he wanted. You made that choice. It's absurd, right? In a strange way, that is a little bit of a summary of the book of 1 John. And that's where we've been all summer. If you're looking for it, it's right at the end of your Bibles. You can turn there with me. We're going to just sum it all up today. We're on the very, very end. And uh, quickly to review, the book is written late in the first century, almost at 100 AD. John himself is in his mid-80s. He's an old man. He's lived his whole life to honor Jesus, to follow Jesus, to teach, to lead as a pastor, as an evangelist, as an apostle. And in his old age, he writes an anxious and desperate letter to his people, to the people who have followed him and he's taught. And this letter is steeped in love. But it's to the second and the third generation Christians. They haven't been through a lot of hard days and persecution like their parents had been. They grew up following Christ and understanding and, and, and they're sliding a little bit. The passion isn't there. So John is hard and straightforward, black and white, but steeped in love, love, love. It's like the grandpa sitting around saying, kids, gather around me. I love you. Look at you all. I'm old. I've spent my whole life and I've taught you and I've shared with you, and from the very beginning, and he starts his book by saying what we've seen, what we've heard, what we've felt, what we've experienced, what we've loved, what we've longed for, those are the things I've shared with you. And he says, you've given your life to Christ. You call him Savior and Lord. You abide in him. He abides in you. You are his children. 
So let me make this simple. Black and white. If you say you abide in him, then live like Jesus lived. That's chapter 2, verse 6. You've given your life to him. Don't keep switching the jersey. Way back in week one of this study, I started by talking about Randy Posh, a university uh, professor who had been diagnosed with cancer, and he, he had his last lecture at the university, which came into a book. And in that, he talks about what is most important. He also talks about what is not most important how we often get those things mixed up. Well, John here is the last surviving disciple of Jesus. He's the last surviving apostle. And he says to them, fill me with joy. Let me die happy and full of hope. You know this. You know this stuff. Now let's get it right. Let's make it real. So what we've done over the course of the summers, we've looked at the phrase over and over and over in this book where he says, I write to you so that you may know. So that you will know. And the idea of knowing and understanding and getting it and grasping it, holding on to it, making it your own, that idea is expressed 75 times in 105 verses. This is what he's getting at. Here's some of the things he says. Um, so we know this is the message, that God is light. Here is how we know that we have come to know him. Here is how we know we live in him. Here is how we know we live in the last days. I write to this to you so you will know the truth. I write this so you can be sure. I write this so you'll be know you are, you are no you are born of God. I write this so we know about his coming again. So you know that he takes away our sin. So you know the reason Jesus came so you will know who the children of God are. It says, this is how we know what love is. This is how we know what truth is. This is how we know Jesus lives in us. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. This is how we can have real life. This is how we know that we abide in Him and Him in us. This is how we know God's love for us. This is how we know we're children of God. This is how we know we have eternal life. And I write these things so you will know you have eternal life. This is the nature of this whole book. This is where we've been this summer. And so today, on the last week of this, we go to the very last four verses of the book. 1 John chapter 5. I'm going to read verses 18 to 21. He writes, We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning, but he who has been born of God protects him. And the evil one does not touch him. We know that we are from God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true, that we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. We're going to look at those four verses this morning. And what I'm going to do, whether you've been with us over the course of this summer or not, I'm going to take these four verses and continually reflect back to the things we've looked at all summer long. And so I'm going to come back to some of the stories we talked about and some of the examples of the illustrations and the points we made because this whole book is summed up in these four verses. Let's start in verse 18. We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning. Now, if you've got a different translation of the Bible than I have here, uh, some of the translations are just very clearly say, no one born of God uh, keeps on sinning. No one born of God sins, it says. Well, whoa, that sounds different. No one born of God sins? Well, I don't know about you, but I sin. And I am human. Does that mean I'm not born of God? That is confusing. So why do the Bible translators say it this way? The literal translation of that, the, literally it says, no one born of God sins. 
And so let me go back to week one when we talked about what sin is. And I said that sin is an archery term. And it literally means anything less than perfection. If you take the shot and it's smack in the middle of the bullseye, that's perfect. Everything, anything other than smack in the middle of bullseye is sin. That's where the word comes from. So it means you've missed the mark. What's the bullseye? What is the mark? Absolute, untainted, precise perfection. Anybody there in our lives? <laughs> the scripture says that sin is all wrongdoing. It's right there. It's in the verse right before that in verse 17. Sin is all wrongdoing, willingly or unconsciously, to miss the mark. To err or mistaken, to miss or to wander from the path. The word trespass fits there perfect. And if I'm walking and I'm trespassing, I'm walking somewhere where I shouldn't be walking. That's the word sin. So it says, someone who is born of God does not keep sinning. What this simply means is does not keep living in a way where I'm shooting arrows all over the place. I know what the target is. And I think if we think about our lives, there's lots of my life where I've, I'm, I'm not an archer, but if I was shooting bow and arrow, I make my own target. I choose that's not the target, that's the target, and I get really good at shooting over there. Or maybe I'm just shooting random all over, or maybe I don't really care it's in the middle or not, I hit the target. All of this is sin. If you flip over just a couple of pages to Hebrews chapter 26, we went there again in, in week one as well, and I read to you Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26, which says this, if we continue to sin deliberately after receiving the knowledge of truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and the, fiery, the fury of fire that will consume God's adversaries. That verse scared the death out of me as a teenager because I didn't understand what it was saying. It's exactly the same concept as we have here in John 5, 18. That once we are born of God, once we have surrendered to him, there, that we do not continue in a lifestyle that is unchanged. We continue in a lifestyle of sin. It's saying that everything changes. Our whole life changes. The hockey player that requested a change is now on the other team. And he doesn't flip back and forth. There's a complete change, a complete transformation of heart. We have been set free from the power of sin. We're not helpless slaves to our passions and desires and sin anymore. One born of God does not continue to live like he did. That's what that's saying. A slave who's set free does not continue to live like a slave. Does he live like a free man? Born of God, don't keep living on as if you don't know God. You know what's right, and we're not doing it. We're shooting arrows aimlessly. But no, now I live with aim. How did we describe this a couple of weeks ago? In the second week of our series, we spent a lot of time talking about the word abide. And in John chapter 2, he, in 1 John chapter 2, he talks about abiding. We talked about the decision to really live there. If I abide in Canada, I'm a Canadian, and I go to work, I, I pay my taxes, I shop in Canada, I live in Canada, my kids go to school in Canada, my whole life is in, wrapped up in Canada. I'm Canadian. So to be in Christ is to decide to live there and to be there, to abide there. And how did we describe that? What illustration did I use? Remember the family that chose to live in the wilderness of Alaska, right? And that TV show, and I talked about that TV show. It's funny how many of you have come up and told me you started watching that show. But they choose to live in Alaska. They chose to live and move and breathe there. And it changes everything about life. 
You can't choose to live there in the wilderness and live like you still live in New York City. Okay, some of you don't know that TV show, so let me rewind a little further. Do you remember the show Green Acres? All right, so they move to the farm, and they're going to farm, and he's always in his suit and tie, and she's the, the big city princess. It just does, and it was funny because it doesn't work. Yet I got to say, that's how way too many of us are trying to live our life in Christ. And we laugh at it, really. So in week one, in John chapter one, verse seven, he wrote, if we walk in the light as he is in the light. And I told you a story about uh, an African missionary who had a lantern and they traveled from uh, village to village. And I'll make, I'll make all these short that we're rewinding and taking a look at again. But um, as they traveled from village to village over the course of, of the week after week after week, at nighttime, if they walked in the pool of light from the lantern, they were safe. And an animal, a predator animal, had never hurt anyone when they walked in the light. But as you know, as we're walking in a group and there's a pool of light from a lantern, half of us are walking outside of the light. And if there was ever an attack from a predator animal, it was always the stragglers behind who were walking in the darkness. Following the light, they could see the light, but they were outside of the pool of light. John writes, if we walk in the light where Jesus is in the light, and we have fellowship with one another. So back to verse 18. We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep going on like he's always gone on. Doesn't continue to live a lifestyle of missing the mark. Why? Because he has picked you up. He has forgiven you and cleansed you and set you right and put you in the middle of the bullseye and says, let's live here. You're part of my family now, called by my name. You bear my name, he says, so be true to who you are. Be true to the name that you bear. And we talked about names, and we talked about him putting his name on us. And I brought this sign from home, and I told you about it. It says Brotherton, right? And it's right up near our door at our exit. It says, be true to who you are and the family name you bear. And we understand that. This is what it means to be part of this family. Not only do we have common family traits and characteristics, and some of us look alike, and we act alike, and we talk alike. It's our family. We bear his name. One born of God, in the family of God, bearing his name to be true to it. Evidence of the family resemblance, because we are becoming more and more just like him. So verse 19, that brings us to verse 19. We know that we are from God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Because we're not living the way we always lived, and everything has changed, we know that we are from, the fa- from God. He is our father, we are his children, he is our king. And we know that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. We talked about this back in chapter 2. In chapter 2, verse 15, it says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, then the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires and the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father. It's from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. And whoever does the will of God abides forever. Children, it is the last hour. And we talked about that, and twice in, in other situations in this book, he talks about how, how the whole world is not, the cosmos is not from the Father. It's under the control of the enemy. The whole world is not God's children. It's not his family. They're not surrendered to his kingship. And I think what John is actually saying is the whole world is sucked in, duped, misled, blinded, controlled by the evil one. And you know what? We think we're in control. For my truck, I have a green slip of paper that is the government-issued statement of my ownership, right? We all have those. And in our five-week study, in week five, I 
talked about signing over the ownership of me. That green slip that declares ownership of me needs to be signed over from the control of the evil one to the control of the king of kings. We need to take control and give it to God. When we think of the ownership of me, is my name on it or is his? That green slip of paper declaring ownership of us actually has the evil one's name on it when we come into this world. He owns us, he controls us until ownership has been transferred very intentionally into the hands of Jesus. Signed over. I am his. That's what John is saying. So how do we know I am in him? We looked at that in week two, week three, and week four. We looked at abide. Where do I live? What defines me? John said, you live here or you don't. Black and white. In week three, I quoted Spurgeon, and I said, you cannot send your heart at the same time in two different directions. So how does this all fit together with verse 18? I no longer continue in a lifestyle of sin because sin no longer rules me. The evil one no longer rules me and controls me. It's not, I never sin again, because we're still human. But I am not defeated. I am not controlled. I am not aimless. I told you a story about uh, a man on the battlefield under Alexander the Great. And he was being disciplined for his behavior and while he was being marched back to headquarters, Alexander the Great himself rode up beside him on a, on a horse and looked down at him and said, what is your name, young man? And he said, Alexander, sir. And what did Alexander say? Do you remember? <clears throat> then either change your name, change your behavior, or change your name. Clear as day. Folks, a saint isn't someone who never fails, but a saint is one who gets up and goes on every single time. So verse 19, we know that we are from God. He is our father, we are his children, he is our king. And we know that we are no longer under the power of the evil one. The choice to accept the forgiveness, the cleansing, the invitation to be adopted into the family of God, to live there, to abide there, to be freed from the control of the evil one. John said, Two weeks ago, we looked at this in chapter 3, verse 17, 18, and 19. Living there dramatically changes who we are because we know the truth. I said that week that John boils everything down to truth. At that time, I said, if you're on any quest in life, make it the quest for truth not driven by getting my own ideas across, not driven by myself or my sin or my longings or control, not driven by church or family or what a teacher says, driven by truth, truth, truth. What's the starting point? No truth and align with truth. And then coming up in the next verse, we have this, one of the strongest statements about Jesus. And we sang this morning, there is power in the name of Jesus. Power to do what? To break every chain. Look at these two verses we've looked at already. Those are chains that the power of Jesus and Jesus' name only can break. What is John saying? We no longer continue that direction. We've stopped. We're going the different direction. We're no longer a slave to the evil one. And here in verse 20, know the truth and align with the truth. And here is what he says. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know Him. So that we may know Him who is true. So that we know Him who is true and we are in Him who is true. Jesus Christ. And then look at the next phrase. It's one of the strongest phrases about Jesus in the whole New Testament. 
This Jesus Christ, he is the true God. He is the true God and eternal life. Jesus himself. If we go back to John chapter 1, the earlier book that John wrote, the gospel about Jesus Christ, how does he start that? We talk about that twice already. Jesus, the word was with God, the word was God, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. In Jesus, we have seen the glory of God himself. And he says, if we believe, we have the right to become the children of God. This was high on the value radar for John. There was nothing more important. Five times in 1 John, he talks about who Jesus is and that being the bottom line. Jesus is the true God. If we go back to the beginning of chapter 4, and right at the end of chapter 3, he says, we know by the Spirit he's given us. Beloved, how do we know every spirit? Test the spirits. And what was the test? The test of the spirits was that they confessed that Jesus came in the flesh. This same truth that Jesus, God himself, came to earth. Week 5, we looked at that and said, stick to the truth. In week 6, we looked at the spirits and the truth and that Jesus came in the flesh. That Jesus is who he claimed to be. That truth changes everything. That, why is that so important? What does this do? This establishes the foundation for the entire Christian faith. This, is, this establishes the foundation for what we've already read in verse 18 and 19. For being freed from the control of the evil one. To continuing, not continuing a life of sin. If Jesus is not God, then cleansing from sin and freedom from control of the evil one is not possible. If Jesus was just a good teacher... I think this is one of the points John is making because in, this, in, in, in Ephesus especially where John was living at this point, the Gnostics were, were gaining lots of momentum. And they were good people and they were spiritual people and the spiritual experience was everything. But there was a distinction between what I experienced and what I believed and it didn't matter how I lived my life. And one of the things that they declared was that Jesus was not God. That at his baptism... The Spirit of God filled him, and he became God in the flesh. And then on the cross, just before he died, the Spirit of God left him, and he was once again human. And John is refuting that clearly here, making a strong statement that Jesus is God. Let me say it this way. If Jesus really is God, what do you do with that? If all of this is true, You can't just say, oh, well, can you? But if Jesus is not God, then why bother with any of this? Brings us to the last verse. Little wee little verse that seems odd at the end of this chapter, at the end of the book. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. If Jesus is God, then he must be given the rightful place in the world. He must be given the rightful place in our lives. Savior, King, Lord, God. This little verse summarizes the whole book. Because what an idol is, an idol is anything in this life that, it's worship, that is worshipped instead of or ahead of God. I've told you before stories of my car when I was a teenager and how I worshipped that and it dominated my life. What is it in our lives that we allow to take the seat or the throne of God himself in our lives? What do we put ahead of that? What do we worship? What do we talk about? What do we think about? What do we long for? What do we spend our money on? All of these things. He's saying here in this last verse to these people, keep yourself from the pollutants of non-Christian worship. Keep yourself from anything that takes the rightful place of God in your life. Along with the idea of the idol is a sense of unreality, a sense of illusion of truth. He's saying keep yourself from all objects of false devotion. 
Ephesus was full of that. It was a very difficult situation for these people. It was a center of immoral rites, of charms and spells. It was dominated by the temple to Artemis, one of the seven wonders of the world. And we've talked lots about that in the last year. He's saying never get lost in the illusions of truth. Never set my heart up with anything or for anything other than God. John is saying, little children, friends that I love so deeply, I'm the old grandpa, let me die happy. Get this right. Give Jesus the rightful place in your life. Nothing takes his spot. In week four, we were in John chapter, or 1 John 3, verse 11 where he said, this is the message you heard from me from the beginning, love one another. And I talked about Vince Lombardi and the Green Bay Packers, and I said, this is a football. And I told you the story of them losing the the Super Bowl and then arriving for training camp the the next uh, year, ready to go and to pick up where they left off. And the wise coach took all these seasoned football players, settled them down, and started at the very beginning. Gentlemen, this is a football. And we talked about that. And John taking the same stance, going back to the very most simple, basic point. And here it is in this book. To summarize all of 1 John, Jesus is the source of life. The beginning and the end. He is my character, my ways, my thoughts, my hopes, my dreams. He alone sits on the throne of my life. And he says to these people, you know this. Nothing takes the place of Jesus. So the last lecture that Randy Posh gave, which turned into that book, as John here, the last surviving disciple, his anxious and desperate letter to the second and third generations. He says, this is what Jesus has done. I told you a story months ago. I'm going to tell you again because I can't think of anything more fitting. To describe the, the summary of 1 John, this whole idea of being free from sin and free from the power of the evil one, to know the truth. And Jesus Christ, twice in 1 John, he says that Jesus is the propitiation for our sins. He is the substitute that sets us free. And I've told you the story of two twins, and one was uh, a, a beautiful character, made right choices, lived well. His identical twin brother was a rebel and nasty, and in and out of jail all the time, and eventually killed someone, was sitting on death row. You remember this story? And uh, his brother, identical twin, came to visit him. And while his, his brother was on death row, he came into the jail and said, Quick, let's change clothes. I will take your place. You walk free. So they switched clothes. And the guilty brother walked out of the jail. He had a choice to make. Because he could walk free and assume the identity of his brother and live free. Changed man, changed character. Or he could walk out of there and continue to live like he always lived and end up right back where he was, right? In the meantime, the good brother, the identical twin, paid the price, went to the death penalty for him to set him free. Folks, that is exactly what Jesus has done. So today, standing here, standing right there, when Jesus says, I'll take your sin on me, I will set you free. I'll take your place. Actually, it's already done. He's already done that. He says, go walk free. Take my name and live. Take my character, take my identity. So what will we do? So maybe today you're sitting here and and that offer is in front of you and you're making the decision. 
Maybe today you have walked free and assumed his identity. Maybe you've walked free and just kept your old identity. This is exactly what these verses are talking about. What will we do? There is power in the name of Jesus to break every chain, to live and abide in him. This is a football. (laughs) This is the most basic, rudimentary thing. Know the truth. The truth will set you free. Let's pray. Well, Jesus, we thank you. Thank you for what you have done for us. Thank you for being the substitute for us to set us free. Thank you for John's writing over and over and over so that you may know, so that you may know, so that you may know. God, it's there in black and white and we know. May we acknowledge the truth, align our lives with truth, Assume your identity. You have put your name on us and set us free from the power of the evil one. May we simply, in humility, give you the rightful place in our lives because of who you are. Thank you for your word. Thank you for how John is so crystal clear. Thank you for the teaching that you've left us in your word. God, would you put us all on a quest for truth that we might know you. Thank you. We ask this in the name of Jesus, son of the most high God. And as John is declaring, Jesus Christ, who is true God and eternal life. Amen.